like y'all are waiting on me. I thought you would appreciate me playing with a guitar that was in tune. Oh, and a drummer. <laughs> Well, good morning. Um, I told you we were gonna we were gonna start this week uh, with doing uh, songs from specific generations uh, and decades, um, with a small caveat that the first song we're doing now is not from more than a hundred years ago. This first one is not. Um, you will you will recognize it as the very first, but it's still a good song. And everything else uh, for the rest of the service um, is, uh, and we're, we'll do a little bit a little of. Um, teaching moments of those other songs. But let's stand together uh, as we sing One Way, God's the Only Way. One, two, three, four. front of the stage, um, a bunch of boxes that are taking shape. 
um, in the back over here. Um, this is all having to do with Vacation Bible School, which is coming up uh, starting one week from tomorrow. So we are excited about that. And in fact, uh, we have a, a special leaders training meeting after uh, right after church today. And uh, so we're, we're, uh, we're grateful for Vacation Bible School, and, and it's coming up. So we're going to have a special time of prayer uh, next Sunday to dedicate uh, our efforts in VBS and also to commission our uh, leaders in Vacation Bible School. And uh, so we'll be doing that next week, but it's never too early to pray for it. You don't have to wait until next Sunday or Monday, and I hope you're not waiting till next Sunday or Monday. Uh, this is a perfect time to... Uh, be praying for VBS. Now, if you're a newcomer with us today, I invite you to fill out this guest information card. These are located on the info tables out in the uh, foyer. You can put that in the drop boxes out there, or you can put them in the offering plates when they come by a little later on in the service. If you're joining us on Facebook, our Facebook page live stream this morning, you can go to westoakwoods.com slash connect, and there's a form there that you can fill out online. And also on the back of these cards, there's places for prayer requests. You don't have to be a newcomer to fill that out. If you have a prayer concern or a prayer request that you would like us to pray for, you can fill that out and turn it in as well. All right, before we go forward in our worship service today, let's take some time to pray for one another. I know that many of us in our Sunday school classes have been talking about prayer this morning. And... Uh, one of the best ways to learn about something is to do it, right? I don't know about you, but I, I learn by doing and by repetition. And so let's take this time now to pray. Let's pray for VBS. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for our church service today. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you so much for our church family Thank you for those who've gathered here in this worship center, for those who are worshiping with us online. We know that there are many in our fellowship who are traveling today. People are graduating. People are on vacation. There's family reunions. There's a lot of things going on right now. But Lord, we pull together at this one moment, this hour, and we say thank you for one another. And God, we also pray for one another in this time. We pray specifically, Lord, for those who are uh, ill or going through difficult life circumstances. We pray for encouragement and patience and healing. God, we pray for our vacation Bible school coming up, that you would send children and parents to us to whom, with whom we can interact and show the love of God and show the gospel to them and show them and share the gospel with clarity. Lord, bless our leaders who will be gathering today for their training time. Bless, Father, the concert that is tonight with our young people from Denton Bible Church coming to lead us in worship. I pray that this whole day would be a reminder that this is your day. This is the Lord's day that we set aside for prayer and for learning and worship, which leads us to this moment, this hour. Speak to our hearts through the songs the scriptures, the sermon, the invitation. We pray that you would clean us out of sin. Help us to deal with the crises in our lives. And God, I pray that you would encourage us and equip us today to be missionaries and evangelists to our neighbors and to our community. And if there's someone here, someone participating with us online, 
who is ready to take that step of faith to repent and turn away from sin and to follow you and receive forgiveness and grace. Today would be the day of rescue and salvation. We pray, Lord, that you would fill our church, our altar, our neighborhoods with people who are seeking after you and that you would send us to them with the good news. Bless our service today. In Jesus' name, amen. John. So as mentioned earlier, the music we're singing in our worship um, this week all comes, uh, originated before the 1930s. Um, some from uh, the 1500s, 1600s, um, uh, hymn writing was very prolific in the 1800s and early 1900s. And so I'm going to take a few moments as we sing these to kind of give you a little bit of backstory on what we're singing. So these first two hymns, we're going to sing uh, The Church is One Foundation and Be Thou My Vision. So The Church is One Foundation um, originated in the middle of the 19th century, and it actually came, it was a rebuttal. So there was a bishop in the Catholic Church who began to doubt the um, authority and accuracy of Scripture and a bishop from the Episcopal Church, Samuel Stone, who was a prolific uh, poetry writer, uh, rebutted that uh, claim uh, of of the questioning of the authority of Scripture. And he came out uh, with this text that we now call the Church's One Foundation. It was actually 10 verses long. We don't sing all 10. but uh, uh, and, And really, no more than five have really ever been published in any hymnal. They usually pick and choose from those. And we'll be singing three today. Um, But uh, his text draws uh, heavily from what we call the Apostles' Creed, which was an early uh, statement of faith for the church and talks about the one universal church with Christ uh, being the head of that church and with all of us, regardless of our divisions, um, claiming a citizenship as members of Christ's kingdom. And then Be Thou My Vision um, actually came from much longer ago. According to mythology, when St. Patrick was a missionary in Ireland in the 5th century, King Logair of Terra decreed that no one was allowed to light any fires until a pagan festival was begun by the lighting of a fire on Slane Hill. In a move of defiance against this pagan ritual, St. Patrick did light a fire, and rather than execute him, the king was so impressed by his devotion, that he let Patrick continue his missionary work. Three centuries later, a monk named Dallin Forgale wrote the Irish poem, Rop tu mo baile. I know I didn't say that right. Be thou my vision, to remember and honor the faith of St. Patrick. Forgale was martyred by pirates, but his poetry lived on as a part of the Irish monastic tradition for centuries until in the early 20th century, Mary Elizabeth Byron translated the poem into English, and in 1912, Eleanor Hull versified the text into what is now a well-loved hymn in prayer that at every moment of our lives, God would be our vision above all else. Let's stand as we sing these two great hymns of the faith. Church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ our Lord. She is his new creation by spirit and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be. One Lord, one faith, one 
Testament reading this morning comes from Joshua chapter 6, starting at verse 15 and reading through verse 21. This is the culmination of the battle of Jericho. Joshua chapter 6, starting at verse 15. It says, Then on the seventh day they arose early at the dawning of the day, and they marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city shall be under the ban, it and all that belongs to it, and all that belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban so that you do not covet them and take some of the things under the ban and make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it. But all the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout. And the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey, at the edge of the sword. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that uh, over this summertime, in our services, in Sunday school, in vacation Bible school. We are faced with the theme of your power and your greatness and your goodness. And Lord, as we think about how powerful and creative you really are, it helps us to understand not only how finite we are, but also how we, however, can depend on your power and your goodness 
to get us through difficult circumstances. We praise you, Lord, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that made the walls of Jericho fall flat, that power resides in the heart of those who put their faith in you. And so we do, as the song says, we pray, be thou our vision, that we can see clearly how to behave, how to work, how to talk, how to pray, and how to live our lives in total glory, for your total glory, for you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. It's about 1674, Bishop Thomas Ken wrote three hymns for morning, evening, and midnight as an addition to his A Manual of Prayers for the Use of the Scholars of Winchester College. These hymns were published by Ken in a pamphlet in 1694 and were included in the manual in the 1695 edition. Praise God from whom all blessings flow was the text of the final doxological stanza for all three of these hymns. It is, known, it is now well known on its own as a doxology or as a concluding stanza for other hymns such as All Creatures of Our God and King or All People That on Earth Do Dwell. We'll also be singing Great Is Thy Faithfulness. Thomas Chisholm, author of Great Is Thy Faithfulness, led a pretty ordinary life. He did not write this hymn during a period of intense grief or after encountering God in a profound way. Instead, he found truth in the words he encountered in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah, on the other hand, was in tumultuous circumstances when writing Lamentations. The people to whom he prophesied did not listen, and he was ostracized and completely alone because of what God called him to do. He also lamented the consequences of their faithlessness. God allowed them to be conquered by the Babylonians, resulting in their entire world being laid to waste. But in the midst of that utter devastation, Jeremiah still offers them hope on the horizon. They are not completely destroyed because of the Lord's compassion and faithfulness. And in the morning, after this dark night of the soul, things will be better. So whether we are at a place in our lives where everything is pretty ordinary or whether we are in a period of grief, no matter what our circumstances, God never changes and is faithful to us, sustaining us in his compassion and faithfulness each and every day. Let's stand. God from whom all blessings flow. 
Yeah. 
celebrate your faithfulness. Uh, God, it is um, a stronghold for us, regardless of the situations we have in life. God, we know that we can stand firm in who you are and your character. God, we can lean on without any fear of it swaying or wobbling. God, use us to spread the news of your faithfulness, that you are the only God who's worthy of honor and glory. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, John and choir. Uh, I'm really going to like this uh, worship through the decades theme that we're doing. That was very meaningful this morning, so... Thank you, John. Very meaningful. Very good. Well, we're going to kick off our summer series of messages today. Uh, the series is entitled Difficult Questions. And uh, before we jump in, let me just say thank you uh, to all those of you who have submitted questions. Um, there are not enough weeks in the summer to get to all of them. So please don't be offended if we don't get to your specific question. Uh, some of you asked, however, the same thing in different ways, and um, we're, we're today going to get at one of those that we got this uh, question multiple times. But uh, just know that there will be enough weeks ahead at some point to catch up on those questions that uh, we can't get to this particular summertime. But let's dive into our first question, and it is this. What about people who pass away, who die, but they never heard about Jesus? In other words, we're talking here about the fact that there is an afterlife. There is, according to the Scriptures a heaven and a hell. And those of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ and receive forgiveness of our sins from him and receive his grace, we stand on God's word to believe that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? I and mean, that's, that's basic Christian belief. But what about those who seemingly never hear. What about a person, say, in China or Afghanistan or maybe even your neighborhood? And they've never heard about Jesus. They're not cognizant of who God is. They have never seen a Bible nor have heard of one. What about them? How does God treat those who've simply never heard? And also mixed into this, we have a very important question as well. What about children? What about innocent children who haven't cognitively gotten to a place where they understand sin or grace? What about the children who were in those classrooms in Uvalde last week? How does God handle that? Do those children spend eternity separated from God? That doesn't seem right, does it? Now, fortunately for us, there is a place in Scripture that talks about this very issue. And by the way, everything that we talk about in this series is going to come not from James Hassel philosophy, but from the Word of God, okay? Here at West Oak Woods, we stand on the Word of God. 
All right, and so for this series, we're going to test every question, every doctrine by the Word of God and what it says. So let's go to the Bible and see if there's a word for us today about responsibility and salvation. If you have access to the Word of God, I'd invite your attention to Romans, the book of Romans. We're going to be in chapter 1 this morning, and we're going to start in verse 18 and read through verse 21. Now, if you don't have a Bible, you can pull that up on your phone. You can uh, share with a friend. There's a Bible in the uh, little uh, rack in front of you. Um, Don't be bashful about asking for a Bible if you need one. Perfectly fine. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18 and reading through verse 21. This is uh, the Apostle Paul writing this, and he says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine uh, nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but They became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now, isn't that passage just a ray of sunshine for you? Let's see what Paul is talking about. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this particularly powerful text to address a particularly important and powerful question. We thank you that your word does not return void. And so I pray that as we deal this summer with difficult questions, that your spirit would light up the biblical text, that we may see the truth of what you want for our lives and for our neighbors. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, given this text and its its density, there's a lot going on here. I think the first thing I need to do is just right off the bat give you the main idea, the main thesis of what Paul is getting at in this text. So if you don't hear anything else today, here's one thing to latch on to. In fact, if you get this one thing and think about it for the rest of my preaching time, I'll be satisfied with that. All right? Here it is. The main idea is this. We are responsible for the revelation about God that we have. Let me say that again. This is something to really think about. We are responsible for the revelation about God that we have. Let me put it another way. For those who have never heard about God, never heard about salvation, never heard about Jesus, never heard about grace, never heard about heaven and hell, God does something for those folks. Paul refers to it in the text. Because of God's great love, because of his character, because of his power, God has pre-programmed creation. He has put a default into creation itself to reveal information about him. Did you realize that? In fact, look at verses 19 and 20 once again. Paul makes it clear. That which is known about God is evident within them. Who's them? Who's he talking about? Pretty much everybody. God has made evident within uh, that which is known about God. God has made evident, for God made it evident to them. What is Paul saying? He's saying that God himself has taken the time, has given the energy and the commitment to make certain things evident and clear about himself, even in creation. 
Are y'all hanging with me here? Okay. In other words, God also has put inside of us something called a conscience. You have a conscience? Yes, you do. Even if you don't think you have one, you do. All right? And what is a conscience? It is the innate capacity to have knowledge that there is a power out there beyond me. It is the capacity in our heads to understand that there is truth and falsehood, there is right or wrong, and I have to make a choice about that in my lifetime. You say, how in the world is that evident in creation itself? Have you looked up at the stars at night? Have you been through a Texas thunderstorm? Have you seen a sunset so beautiful that you do not have words to describe it? That's God's pre-programming. You don't, as someone out in the bush of Australia who's never had a missionary set foot in their land, simply by looking up at night, their conscience says to them, There is something beyond me that I've got to get in touch with. Now, you can deny that. You can suppress it, which we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But God has pre-programmed things to make it evident to you that he exists. And every person is responsible for that Revelation of God. Let me give you a concrete example. I That's right. Oh, I'm back on. This is how Satan messes with us. See, he doesn't want you hearing some of this. Give you a concrete example. In fact, this is something called general revelation, if you want to sound real fancy to your friends today. It's how God reveals things about himself. I watched my wife give birth to two children. And when Jackson was born, there was a group of nursing students when Shannon was in labor, a group of nurses, about 10 of them, that came to observe. And that wasn't awkward at all. Uh, <laughs> And they were, you know, they were observing, they were just taking notes. I was like, that's my wife on the table. <laughs> um, but I, I watched one of these students. She was pro- probably in her 20s, very young, and, and she was beginning to turn all sorts of shades of green. And I thought, she is about to hit the deck. And uh, her teacher caught this and said, do you need to go get some fresh air? She said, yeah. She walked out. And at that point, dad got to help. And I was really proud of that. Um, And I didn't faint. Oftentimes I faint at the sight of blood and things like that, but not in the, I was a a trooper. Um, But those of you who have ever witnessed a child being born, especially your own, will admit in that moment, and I don't really know how to describe it, you, are, you will know that you are witnessing something that is utter, otherworldly. It's not of, of you. That's God's revealing himself. And when my kids were born, I would even talk to some of the nurses, some of whom had worked on the, on the, the, the labor and delivery floor for, for, for 30 years. And they said, I can't describe it to you, but every single time a child is born, there is something in that room that, that makes me have goosebumps or tear up. That's God. We are responsible for God's revealing himself in those moments, even if we've never heard. But let me get really serious about that. 
let's say a man or a woman has never heard the gospel, has just observed some things and made some preliminary conclusions about God. What happens when they die? I think based on the word of God, God holds them accountable for the revelation that they do have. In other words, have they responded in faith? Have they obligated themselves to the one true God, even on that very sliver of revelation that they have received about God? Because here's the deal. The Bible is very, very clear. We are saved, rescued from our sins, reconciled to God through faith, not through works. You can't earn it. Faith is what counts as righteousness. Surrendering to God. So the question here is, has the person who has never heard anything, how do they respond, how have they responded in faith to what they do already know? And with that, let me talk about children. The Bible is very clear that because of Adam and Eve's free will choice, they sinned. And you and I are sinners too. Did you realize that? Hope you, I hope you got that nailed down. <laughs> we are all sinners. However, some children are not at an age where they can clearly perceive, as Paul is talking about perception here in verse 20. Some children and even adults are not at a place where they can clearly perceive of God's revelation through Jesus Christ. Some are born even with physical and mental or mental limitations that impact their perception of spiritual things. So here is my personal belief. You don't have to take this, but you can uh, certainly think about it. This is how I believe. I believe that God applies the saving blood of Jesus to those children and even adults who cannot perceive or have the capacity to reason about God's revelation. I think God is graceful to them. In fact, let me tell you a really cool story. In one of the churches I pastored, there was a young man. He was about 18 years old. He had some severe... Um, problems with his perception of things. But he was one of the most loving, funny people I have ever known. I loved hanging out with him. And his parents were worried about his salvation. And we talked about that. But then one day he started talking to them about being baptized. Why? Because he'd seen it at church. He was beginning to respond in faith the best way he knew how. And I believe that young man is saved. In fact, I think some of us are going to be really surprised one day when we go to heaven and see some people who we didn't think would be there. You got in? Woo! God's grace is a lot bigger than what I can perceive. Now, I am not a universalist, and I'm not a Unitarian. And you can quote me on that. We are saved by grace through faith because of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, that gets us to a little, the other side of this coin. There is grace. but. There's also this. If you are aware of Christ, of the Bible, of the gospel, it is possible for you and I to suppress that truth. 
Paul gets rather blunt about this. I hope you caught that in this passage. He says that those who see God's revelation, even in creation, are without excuse. That word in the Greek means they have no case in God's court. They didn't act in faith. In other words, at the judgment seat of Christ, we can't say, well, nobody ever told me anything about you, so, you know, I'm just free to go, right? No. In verse 18, Paul says that God's wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth, meaning that there are folks who see God's work, who hear of God's revelation made perfect through Jesus Christ. They hear the gospel, but they make a conscious decision to turn away from it. They suppress the truth. This may sound kind of funny, but this is the way it's worded in Greek. The, the word suppress means to have a box, and you put a lid on the box, and you sit on it. Literally sitting on the truth. You suppress that truth. You sit on it. (laughs) Isn't that quite a picture? There's the gospel. I ain't doing nothing with it. I'm going to sit on it. What happens when we sit on the truth? What does Paul say? He says that God allows minds to be darkened. You know, sometimes I think we think of God's wrath as the old Greek mythology, Zeus with this lightning stick in his hand, he throws it down at people he's mad at. I don't see God's wrath that way. I see God's wrath as much more subtle than that. When people make a conscious decision to say no to him, he doesn't strike you down with a lightning bolt. His wrath is saying to you, If that's what you want, that's what you can have. And the shades go dark in the soul. That's much worse to me than a lightning bolt being thrown at me. We probably see this lived out the most at the actual crucifixion of Christ. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and the two criminals were there with him, one was crucified uh, uh, near him, and that was the one who sat on the truth, right? He was responsible for the revelation that he had, but how did he respond to Jesus? Heal yourself. If you were really who you say you are, you'd get down from that cross. What did the other guy do? The other criminal on the cross, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How did Christ respond to those two? To the one who didn't sit on the truth, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So friends, it's incumbent really upon us as believers at West Oak Woods Baptist Church, to remember two things when it comes to this question. One is, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it is really time for you to get serious about sharing your faith. We probably shouldn't ask, we should probably ask less about what happens to people who've never heard about Jesus, and start asking why it is that they have never heard. Does that make sense? We have got to share the gospel. In Romans 10, later on, Paul says, how then are they to call on him who they they haven't believed? And how are they going to believe about him if they've not heard? And how are they going to hear without a preacher? You are being sent, church family. And you may say, well, Pastor James, I'm not good at uh, knocking on somebody's door and uh, handing out a track or, or doing something. I'm not asking you to do that. 
In fact, a lot of the statistics today tell us that in America, if you try to do evangelism just by cold calling, it's not very effective. But I tell you what is effective, your lifestyle and you making conscious decisions to engage with people about spiritual things. And let me tell you something, even if you are really fearful about sharing your faith, let me ask you to do something. Bring them to church. Just bring them with you. I'll preach the gospel. I will preach it to them. They will hear it when they come here. Bring them. Here's the second thing. Some of you may be newish to all of this, but God has led you here for a reason. He has revealed some things about himself to you, and you aren't sitting on the truth. You may, however, be trying to figure out what this is all about. Let me tell you, this is about your life, not just life after death. It's about having life right now. Because, see, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because we've sinned, our relationship with God has been torn asunder. And there's no way, no way in our power that we, that we can make ourselves right with God again. It's God's power. And God wants to be reconciled with you. How is that possible? God came down in flesh. And he lived a sinless, perfect life. And he died on the cross for you, he was in your place. He paid your sin debt. He paid it in full with his blood. And he died and was buried. And on the third day, in all power, he conquered death and got up out of that grave. Here's why that's important. Because Jesus died for you and rose from the dead, he is extending to you the gift of forgiveness and grace. His outstretched hand is before you. What will you do? That is the gospel. Will you receive that? If so, there's no magic formula. You don't have to repeat a mantra or a saying. There's no incantation or religious stuff. You just cry out to God, Lord, save me. Forgive me. Give me a new heart. And when you cry out to God, what does he do? His very spirit indwells your soul, and you get born all over again in your spirit. That's why this is important. And because you've heard that gospel, God's holding you accountable for that. How will you respond to him? Let's pray. God, thank you for this question and for the answer to it. That there are some who never hear. They never get a chance to hear the gospel. They can still suppress the truth or open up in faith. And there are those of us here in this room, watching online, surrounded by neighbors, and yes, we've heard about Christ, we've heard about the gospel. But Lord, are we suppressing it? Are we sitting on it? I pray today, Lord Jesus, that you would motivate those of us who have
have a reconciled relationship with you, and yet we're, we're not sharing our faith. We're not sharing the good news that Jesus has died for us and rose from the dead victorious. I pray that we would have a new perspective, a new energy to get the gospel outside the walls of our church building and the walls of our homes. I pray also, Lord, for those who have a decision to make whether or not to follow you and to receive the gift of forgiveness and grace that you paid for on the cross. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to your spirit as you speak to us about what decision we need to make and help us to make the right choice in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I know we are late in the hour, but I don't want to suppress anything that the Holy Spirit may be doing or speaking to us today. We have an invitation. We call it an invitation every Sunday in our worship service. It's a time of our worship where we open up for people to come and to pray for, the people, for people to come and say, Pastor, I'm looking for a church to be a part of. I want to be a part of this one. A time for you to come and say, Pastor, I'm not sitting on the truth anymore. I've heard it, and I know I'm accountable for it, and I'm coming. I don't know everything in the world. I don't know all the books in the Bible. I don't know all the, the fancy stuff, but I do know that Jesus died for me, and I want to be forgiven of my sins and made new again. I'm asking Jesus to come into my life. Or pastor, I come today because I, I, I need to be baptized. The, the, the wash away the old and the new person comes up to give that picture, show that picture of what has happened in my very spirit and my soul. Whatever God is leading you to do today, I'm going to be down here at the front. When we stand in just a moment, John's going to sing an invitation song. And that, that when we stand and sing, come, come. You don't have to come along. Bring a friend with you. Bring your family. Say, Pastor, here we are. Here I come. Here I am. This is symbolic of what I'm doing with Jesus. Jesus has said, come follow me. And I'm saying, yes. Do you say yes to Jesus today? Would you stand and respond as God leads you? Jesus, keep me near the cross. There are precious fountains free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. sensitive to God's spirit today and 
uh, please uh, know that our invitation is not something that just lasts a minute or two in our worship service. The invitation is always open. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can call, you can text, you can get a hold of us and say, Pastor James, I, I need prayer. I need to talk with you more about this. I'll be glad to visit with you about it. So I um, want you to always know that the invitation is always open. Um, let's uh, prepare now for our offering. I'm going to ask that our, uh, those who are helping to take up our offering go ahead and come forward. Looking for my notes here. And as we prepare for this offering, we know that uh, those gifts through tithes and offerings make a, a great difference for how we cooperate together, not only in our church, but with other churches and funding missions and evangelism at home and around the world. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this wonderful day today, this great service of worship. And we pray now for our offering that it would be multiplied and used for your glory. We pray that because we give, many people who have never heard will hear the message. That we, through giving, would be responding to your very Spirit's call and commission on us to go into the whole world and make disciples for Jesus. So help us now to give cheerfully and give liberally. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give. few announcements before we are concluded and dismissed today. First of all, uh, we will be having our VBS leader training uh, right after the conclusion of the service today. Uh, Shannon has gone to get uh, our uh, sandwiches from HEB. So that sounds really good. So we'll eat to you. Yeah, we got some applause for that. Um, I, I do need a favor, however. Uh, I do need a favor from us. Uh, we need to, as soon as the service is concluded, clear out that section of uh, the sanctuary of the chairs and the pews back there and move in some of the round tables. That's going to help us in, in, in two ways. One, it's going to help us for lunch today. And secondly, uh, we'll already have those set up because tonight we have the middle school choir from Denton Bible Church on their mission trip and coming through. They're going to be giving us a concert this evening, and we'll have worship with them, and then we're going to feed those children tonight. And so uh, we're going to need those tables set up for that. So after we're done here, if some of you could uh, stick around and help us to get those tables set up, uh, the more we have helping, the quicker it gets, it, it gets done. So uh, that's, uh, that's coming up. Also, uh, two other things, and then Laverne has our June birthdays. First of all, you may uh, have seen out in the foyer that uh, there are free Father's Day cards available for you. Father's Day is coming up, and um, some are, are for dads, uh, husbands, father-in-law, grandpas, you name it. So uh, take as many as you want. Those are out in the foyer. And then, uh, last but certainly not least, our VBS theme is monumental, as you can see on the sign here. The monumental food drive is starting. This will benefit the uh, uh, Austin Baptist Center. Is that what it's called? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, 
It will be staying local. Um, we are challenging the VBS kids this year to be uh, to uh, create to build a mountain of canned foods. Baptist Community Center. Baptist Community. Thank you. Um, I knew it had center in it, and it had Baptist in it. Um, all right. So next week, June twelfth, we're asking the congregation to help us build a mountain of food, okay, with canned goods, and then we're going to challenge the kids to meet or surpass what we have collected. D does that make sense? So we're going to have a competition between the kids and our congregation to see who can build the best amount, uh, biggest amount of food. The winners, ooh, I didn't know this. This is fresh off the press. The winners, this comes from Tammy, the winners will get Bluebell ice cream. The pressure is on. After VBS is over, we will continue our monumental food drive through the end of June, collecting dried beans, rice, pasta, canned meat, and more canned goods. That comes to you from our missions committee, and uh, I'm appreciative of their support and their work. All right, Laverne, come, and let's hear who has a birthday in June, and then we will be dismissed. Can you use that mic right there? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um... June the 1st, Jessica Pfeiffer. June the 9th, Donna Maxwell. June the 13th, Kelly Montgomery. June the 15th, Brian Thomas and Jody Van Slyke. Look up at me, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> June the 16th, <laughs> Jack Shooter. Uh, June the 21st, White Harrell. June the 22nd, Betty Flangey and Susan Reed, and Stephanie Simmons. And June the 24th, Marcella and Araceli Guadalajara. Guadalajara. <laughs> ah, however you pronounce it. Anyway. <laughs> Very good. All right. Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, June, folks. Thank you, Laverne. Appreciate that. All right, would you stand and we will conclude our service for today. God, thank you for this uh, time of worship and digging deep into the Word of God and singing uh, great, uh, great hymns of our faith today. Lord, I pray for our Vacation Bible School meeting to come, the decorating to come, and finally next week as we... Uh, bring our canned goods as we uh, prepare to host children and uh, to show them the best of our hospitality and most importantly to teach them the gospel and the importance of God's word. Help us, Lord, as we go out into our week and our various obligations that we have to friends, family, and our neighbors that top of mind will be to proclaim the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried, and three days later, you rose him from the dead in all power. He's appeared to many, and he's coming back. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.